Welcome everybody to NUPIS Cybersecurity Center uh, and this seminar with Patrick Maldre, who is a senior cyber threat intelligence analyst at FireEye. FireEye is a global cybersecurity company with its headquarters in, located in uh, California. It has more than 5,300 customers across 67 countries. It was founded in uh, 2004 and provides cybersecurity services and products to protect against advanced cyber threats. FireEye has, has been used in the investigations against several major cyber attacks, where the attack against Sony Picture is perhaps the most, uh, most known. Before joining FireEye, Mulder focused on the political and strategic aspects of cybersecurity as both a diplomat in Estonia and as an analyst in the US. With his capacity and experience, he is uniquely positioned to understand current global cyber threats, how these increasingly affect the Nordic countries, where the, these threats come from, and the role of cyber intelligence. And we are very happy to welcome him to NUPI. Hosting talks and lectures like this is an important function for NUPI's cybersecurity center. Uh, as one of our goals is to be a platform for key persons, politicians, academics, and experts who can share unique, important, and insightful perspectives on international relations and cybersecurity. The background, the background for today's topic is that nation state cyber threat actors are increasingly conducting operations against public and private sector to steal sensitive information, but also to destroy data and critical infrastructure. Media headlines about the hacking of the Democrats in the USA a year ago, about the fears of elections in Europe being disturbed by hacking and leaks, as well as an increased amount of cyber attacks, such as the Stuxnet attack, the attack on Estonia, the attacks on the Ukrainian power grid, the hacking of the NSA and the WannaCry attack has increasingly put cybersecurity on the agenda of international politics. With this background and in this context, we are now looking forward to learn more from Mulder about cyber threat actors and the challenges they pose to the Nordic uh, security. And also to learn more about the role that cyber intelligence can play in supporting both strategic leaders and tactical defenders. Mulder will deliver his 40 minutes talk, and after his talk, we will invite Lily Miller, who is a research fellow focusing on cybersecurity here at NUPI, to, to give uh, some brief comments and a couple of questions to Mulder. And this will be followed by a Q&A session where you will be uh, able to ask questions to, to Mulder. I should also mention that the seminar will be recorded and uh, that it may be published at a later stage. And um, I should also mention that the restrooms, if you uh, need to use them, they are out that door and, and then to the left. Um, and then, so without further ado, uh, I would uh, like to in, uh, invite Mulder to uh, enter the podium. Okay. Quick second here. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Nupi for inviting me to this event. Um, thank you to all of you who decided to brave what I understand is a pretty serious Norwegian uh, winter storm to come here into this nice warm room to listen to uh, cyber intelligence and, uh, and how that affects uh, international relations. Uh, thank you, uh, Niels, of course, for the, for the kind introduction. And uh, I have to say that uh, I couldn't help but notice that I'm the third Estonian in uh, about three months to speak at NUPI. And so uh, I, while I don't believe that I uh, should be honored to share the same stage as uh, my country's president and my former boss, Marina Kailuran, uh, I am honored to be here and uh, hopefully uh, 
say enough interesting things to make your, uh, make your time here worth it as well. So uh, I am here to talk about uh, a subfield of cybersecurity that's known as cyber intelligence. Uh, cybersecurity, as many of you know, is increasingly making its way into uh, policy and strategy conversations around the world, um, but also into your uh, individual uh, technological lives. Um, while a lot of uh, cybersecurity conversations end up being very technical, uh, I think cyber intelligence, and especially strategic cyber intelligence, will be uh, a subfield of cybersecurity that will be very relevant to uh, the type of audience that I think Nupi attracts. Uh, and also, uh, I'll try to stay away from, uh, from any substantial technical detail, not only because of the sensitivity of what that involves for uh, people working in this field, but also because I don't think it's uh, often necessary to make some of the broader points that I intend to make today. So uh, this is a, an overview of what I plan on uh, talking about today. Uh, I'll probably skip over the uh, profile. I'll talk a little bit about what cyber intelligence is, where it came from, uh, how it applies to the Nordics, what we know about uh, the Nordic threat landscape, and uh, I'll primarily focus on uh, cyber espionage rather than uh, cyber crime or hacktivism. Uh, and I'll specifically focus on uh, what we refer to as Russian nexus actors and China nexus actors, um, the threat that they pose. Um, I'll briefly discuss uh, connected threats such as information operations and uh, infrastructure abuse. Uh, and then I'll finish the talk with a, uh, a little bit of a warning uh, as to what we uh, at FireEye and otherwise consider uh, a, an important topic, which is the rising risk to critical infrastructure uh, from uh, cyber threat actors. So I intend to treat this essentially as uh, similar to briefings that uh, FireEye representatives give to uh, cyber commanders, political leaders, but also uh, IT managers, business executives, and so on. Um, and I'll, I'll go through it as a brief, but I'm happy to get into a um, less formal uh, format and structure in the Q&A that follows. So uh, my background, a little bit of uh, military service in Estonia, um, education in political science, international relations. Uh, I think Niels mentioned the rest of it. And I'll launch right into it. So uh, cyber intelligence is essentially a subfield of cybersecurity. Um, it has uh, matured, I would say, in the last uh, decade or so, although uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of uh, improving capabilities and capacity around the world. Um, but uh, what cyber intelligence is, or cyber threat intelligence, is uh, essentially knowledge about adversaries and their motivations, uh, their intentions, uh, but also the methods that are uh, used to collect, analyze, and disseminate uh, that information in ways that help uh, security and business staff at all levels uh, protect their organizations to, uh, to safeguard the data that um, all of your organizations produce, uh, process, uh, and need and want to keep confidential uh, and available uh, to you at all times. So uh, in the past, we've had uh, a lot of focus, uh, well, and we still do, of course, as we should, on the technology uh, involved in cybersecurity, so whether that's uh, you know firewalls or uh, antivirus, anti-malware, and so on, um, a lot of what that technology uh, we think uh, uh, involves is sort of building up your defenses, uh, sitting inside of your own network, trying to figure out what the best way to secure it is, uh, and so uh, cyber intelligence um, sort of matured after. Uh, many cyber defenders, uh, network defenders, realize that in order to be better prepared, in order to defend their organizations better, uh, they also need some information about what's going on outside of their own networks. Uh, you can get that to some degree from the media. You can get that from, uh, you know, security companies. You can get that from government agencies that uh, share this kind of information. Um, but uh, cyber intelligence is essentially the application of intelligence to cybersecurity where we uh, focus very closely on the uh, threat actors uh, that we see um, conducting operations all around the world. Uh, and we then try to warn our uh, customers and the wider public about who they are, what they do, and why. So 
When I say it's adversary based, it's uh, because we try to identify, analyze, and predict the actions of specific cyber threat actors. Uh, when I say it's risk focused, it's because uh, we believe that uh, cyber intelligence <laughs> is intended to reduce the risk that organizations face from um, these specific actors. Uh, when I say it's process oriented, uh, that really refers to the intelligence side of things. So, um, uh, cyber intelligence, threat intelligence, essentially the application of uh, well-known intelligence uh, processes and methodologies to uh, cybersecurity. And uh, when I say tailored for diverse customers, it's because uh, every organization uh, that uh, uses computers, that uses technology, has a different profile. Uh, different level of risk, different adversaries that may target it, and uh, and so the intelligence that may be valuable for, uh, for example, a large uh, energy company may not be the same uh, intelligence that's useful for a uh, small government agency, for example. Uh, and so uh, intelligence is uh, useful insofar as it is uh, tailored to uh, a specific audience. Now, in this particular case, we're picking a rather broad topic of uh, the Nordics, as such, as a target for uh, threat operations. But of course, you can uh, you can have very specific tailored cyber intelligence products to uh, your organization, even to specific uh, parts of your organization, to uh, even specific kinds of data that your um, organizations protect. And so what we think the uh, end goal or purpose of cyber intelligence is that it really helps uh, uh, organizations transition to intelligence-driven or intelligence-led security. So uh, this is the direction that FireEye as a company is going. Uh, this is the direction that um, we feel that uh, many other organizations could benefit from uh, going towards. Uh, and it's really um, a matter of uh, network defenders and strategic leaders not just worrying about uh, every new threat that uh, emerges in the media, every um, sort of new vulnerability, but really have a better idea of uh, what out of that huge mess of information that exists about cybersecurity is really relevant to their organization. Um, and, uh, and so uh, cyber intelligence helps you focus uh, your defensive resources on the threats that actually uh, affect you and target you. Uh, usually, um, in the emerging academic literature on cyber security, cyber intelligence, excuse me, um, we apologize for that. I'm moving forward on my own computer, but not on the screen here. Um, so this is the slide that I just went through, and. Um, when we talk about cyber intelligence, we usually divide it into three categories. So tactical, operational, and strategic cyber intelligence. Um, tactical refers to uh, your organization's uh, usually IT staff and their day-to-day -day processes, uh, including trying to detect threats in order, uh, uh, in order to protect your data. Uh, it refers to um, the uh, alerts that are generated from a variety of technologies and how to prioritize them. It refers to uh, which vulnerabilities uh, you should patch in your systems and so on. And uh, cyber intelligence at the tactical level helps, uh, helps those uh, engineers, uh, analysts, and so on uh, prioritize their work, um, figure out uh, which, uh, for example, vulnerabilities to fix first because they know that specific actors are targeting uh, companies in their industry elsewhere, and so they should probably be prepared for this threat. Um, it helps to, uh, to prioritize the, the sort of day-to-day -day alerts that they face from security technologies to figure out what out of the mess of data that they have that they actually need to focus their time and resources and attention on, uh, and what they need to escalate. What are very, very serious threats that you shouldn't have just one engineer in a dark room uh, trying to figure out what you maybe should uh, brief your executives about, get your business staff on board, and do a sort of holistic um, analysis effort by your entire IT or cybersecurity team. Or, uh, you know, what uh, sort of threats you need to escalate to the police or the uh, domestic intelligence agency or whoever the relevant authority is in your country. Uh, operational threat intelligence uh, refers to uh, mostly to incident response processes. So uh, operational cyber intelligence can help organizations who are already dealing with a cyber uh, operation, essentially. So 
when, uh, when network defenders figure out what's going on in the system, they see that something is wrong, they see that something is bad, they see activity that uh, is suspicious, um, they want to uh, investigate that, conduct what is known as uh, incident response. And uh, cyber intelligence can help in this process because the incident responders may just see uh, one tiny piece of information, whereas, uh, for example, a company with, like FireEye with uh, global intelligence capabilities and, uh, and a global footprint uh, may have seen the same cyber threat actor targeting somebody else in that sector in, uh, you know, halfway across the world, but we know that that little piece of technical data is part of, uh, of a wider attack process by a very advanced threat actor, and we, in many cases, have already done the analysis. We figured out what malware they use, we figured out what their tactics are in the network, and uh, so operational cyber intelligence can help uh, those cyber defenders that are uh, that are already conducting or you know, sort of dealing with an attack already uh, deal with it more effectively, know more about the adversary that's already in their system, uh, and uh, more effectively um, kick them out essentially. Uh, but what I'll be focusing the rest of my talk today on is uh, strategic cyber intelligence. So uh, this is uh, more broader. Uh, usually, it can refer to statistics or uh, reports uh, at, a, at a more general level about who uh, the relevant cyber threat actors are, uh, what they do, how you can defend yourself against them uh, at, a, at a general sort of policy and, and business investment perspective. And, um, and also strategic intelligence usually helps to uh, or is intended to um, deepen uh, the audience's, uh, the consumer's understanding of what cybersecurity is, how these threats uh, connect to uh, other security threats that they face, the wider uh, sort of international political context, um, and uh, also uh, strategic intelligence often supports uh, conversations between IT people and, uh, and policymakers and executives who may not have any technical background but who need to make decisions relevant to uh, an organization's or a country's or an alliance's uh, cyber defense. I'm going to sneak a quick water glass here. Um, it's not often that I have to wear a suit and tie. I work from home in my, uh, in my sweatpants, so I um, appreciate your patience here. The same uh, young man that usually works on his couch in his sweatpants shares a stage with uh, the president of his country. Yeah, so I'll let you make your... Uh, deductions about what that means for the state of the world today. But uh, coming back to the Nordic threat landscape, um, these are the three main categories of threats that uh, FireEye thinks uh, the Nordics uh, have to deal with. Um, I won't be focusing too much on cybercrime, which generally um, is conducted by uh, financially motivated actors that can target um, a variety of different industries and, and more rarely governments. Uh, and I also won't be focusing extensively on uh, hacktivism, which is essentially uh, politically motivated actors that conduct, uh, that are usually uh, much less sophisticated, much less organized, much uh, worse resourced, um, but uh, still can conduct a variety of threat activities such as DDoS attacks or website defacements that can, uh, that can um, disrupt business and, and sometimes uh, affect policy. Uh, but I don't think that's the uh, main strategic threat that um, that Nordic countries face. I believe cyber espionage is the uh, is the is the main threat, and uh, I hope all of you will also be most interested in in that category. So before we uh, jump in further, I want to show you a graphic. Um, if you're in the cybersecurity field, you've probably seen some kind of version of this. You may have heard of the term cyber kill chain. Uh, we refer to this as the attacker life cycle. So uh, essentially it's the process uh, for how advanced uh, threat actors uh, carry out cyber operations. So um, you hear a lot in the media about cyber attacks happening at the speed of light, um, which, you know, while is the case for how, you know, electrons and data move across fiber optic networks, for example, um, when we talk about advanced cyber threat actors, we actually see that often they conduct operations um, in terms of days, in terms of months, in terms of uh, even years to some degree. And uh, today we have uh, organizations with very complex networks, so often it can take a long time to figure out 
uh, for these actors to figure out how to get to the data that they uh, are actually the most interested in. Uh, but you see that uh, essentially they go through the stages of initial compromise. That's uh, where they would use social engineering or um, a variety of other ways to get initial access, exploiting your uh, web-facing servers and so on. Uh, establishing a foothold, that's usually when uh, they will, uh, advanced threat actors will uh, gain initial access, but they want to uh, essentially uh, keep that access, further that access, get to more places around the network, get to the data that they're really interested in. Uh, so many advanced threat actors have different tools that they use at these different stages. Uh, they also want to, uh, in many cases, if they can, avoid detection and attracting interest. So. Uh, they'll use smaller, quieter tools in the established foothold um, part of the process. Uh, once they get onto the system and they have the kind of uh, sort of initial foothold that they want, they'll look further around the system. They'll conduct internal reconnaissance. Uh, usually the first uh, device, the first endpoint computer that advanced threat actors um, get access to is not what they ultimately want on the system. So if you're a diplomat in the foreign ministry, for example, um, you know, you could get targeted, they might get access to your email, but uh, maybe they really want the minister's email, or maybe they really want the, um, you know, the plans for um, what your country will say at the next NATO summit. And so they have to look further into the shared drives that you may uh, uh, use and access. They might want um, budgetary information that that uh, person may not have. Uh, they may be interested in 12 other topics that that uh, initial compromise uh, does not have access to. And so though, look further around the network, they'll uh, move laterally, uh, compromise different uh, parts of the network, different endpoints, different servers that deal with um, uh, either emails or file transfers or uh, what have you. Uh, and then they'll try to maintain presence in many cases for a long time. So uh, a lot of these threat actors, they put a lot of effort into developing their tool sets. They've thought very carefully about uh, who they're going to target and why, and they want, uh, in many cases, uh, if they can achieve it, uh, long-term access to your networks and your data. Um, and, and in many cases, they're successful. You often hear about um, threat actors being in a system for months, years before they're detected uh, and before the threat is resolved. Uh, and ultimately, of course, they'll want to complete the mission. So whether that mission is stealing data, whether that mission is uh, altering data, whether that mission is causing physical effects, um, they'll, uh, at a very high level, uh, ultimately move to complete their mission. So, let's dig in further. Um, cyber espionage, which we'll be focusing on today, is uh, essentially uh, breaching political and military organizations to gain a decision-making advantage in international relations. Uh, basically, uh, in most cases, in pursuit of strategic goals. Um, so uh, the information that these threat actors will be looking for can include um, upcoming negotiations, uh, sanctions, discussions, plans for military exercises. Uh, many of you that work in the government field have uh, some idea of what data would be valuable to other countries that you engage with. and so. Um, you can imagine the sort of data that they might be interested in uh, gaining access to. Um, this can also involve uh, what we refer to as intelligence preparation of the battlefield. Uh, so scanning and mapping out different networks, um, figuring out uh, how to uh, prepare for future operations, uh, essentially have, uh, have a foothold in an organization such that if uh, that organization or that country does something they don't like, they are already in a position to uh, essentially um, make them feel the effects of those decisions. Uh, so we, of course, have political and military uh, cyber espionage, which is, uh, which is very connected, but also uh, somewhat connected, often separate, uh, is the, the question of industrial espionage as well. So. Uh, we have a variety of threat actors that have targeted the Nordic countries over the years, um, a variety of industries that have been targeted. Um, I will now launch further into uh, who these actors are, who they've targeted, why they've done so, uh, what we uh, assume their uh, mission is, and, uh, and uh, you know, what they might do in the future, essentially. So, 
Uh, this is a graphic of, um, of Russian Nexus threat actors. Um, FireEye refers to uh, a country and a nexus to that country as uh, entities that uh, we believe exhibit the characteristics of uh, military intelligence agencies, but when we say nexus, in no way are we uh, asserting that they are, in fact, a particular uh, organization uh, or paid for by a particular organization um, or that, uh, you know, we uh, have the ability to disclose exactly who they are. So when I say nexus, uh, take that as uh, uh, certainly softening the blow in terms of uh, who they are, uh, but in many cases uh, we've been able to track them for decades. Uh, we have a variety of data points that indicate that they uh, support the strategic goals of uh, a particular country, and so uh, that's why you'll see this term nexus um, a lot over the course of the presentation. Uh, so you see here a couple of teams, maybe some of them you've seen from uh, the news, uh, maybe some of them you've heard of specific operations that they've conducted. Uh, APT-28 and APT-29, of course, of uh, DNC hack fame. Uh, Turla team is a uh, advanced threat actor that um, is much more uh, silent, has higher operational security, uh, who is uh, uh, probably, we think, one of the oldest uh, Russian Nexus cyber uh, threat actors and um, uh, who is active in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, Sandworm team is a, is a group that uh, became active in 2011, targeted a variety of different Western organizations over the course of a couple of years. Uh, but then, essentially, since 2014, has focused almost exclusively on Ukraine. Um, this is the team that we uh, uh, have some data to support their involvement in the um, Ukrainian power grid uh, operations. Uh, but they have been uh, extremely actively targeting Ukraine uh, since 2014, targeting uh, the financial sector, um, you know, a variety of critical infrastructure sectors, including railways and aviation, uh, and a, a very advanced threat team. And uh, Qual team is, uh, and you see some of the other aliases that other security companies and organizations refer to them as, was a cyber threat actor that was uh, active, extremely active in 2014, then went uh, a little bit uh, under the radar, and um, now is uh, possibly um, is possibly experiencing a resurgence in activity. Uh, some people, some organizations have, uh, have published information about what they refer to as Dragonfly 2.0, uh, who now uh, has reemerged to target um, industrial control systems uh, information in a variety of uh, uh, countries around the world, including, um, including in our region. Uh, or in Europe more broadly, but I'll get to quality team later as well. So these are threat actors that we've seen uh, conduct activity against countries in the Baltic Sea region, um, the Baltics, Poland, Germany, uh, Finland, Sweden, uh, Norway, and Denmark. So uh, Russian Nexus actors. Um, as you're well aware, probably from uh, from media sources and otherwise, uh, these actors are highly active and aggressive, uh, conduct operations uh, against targets that are in line with Russian strategic interests, um, and uh, they much more heavily target government uh, than they do uh, industry, but we've certainly seen them target the energy sector, we've seen them target uh, the defense sector, and uh, and presumably some other ones. Um, so one that I'll focus on uh, in a little bit more detail today is APT-28. Um, I'm happy to talk about the other threat actors uh, in the Q&A as well. Uh, but APT-28 is probably the most prominent threat to the region. Uh, it um, basically conducts political and military cyber espionage, tries to discover the secrets of other countries. Uh, and also has evolved to conduct a variety of different uh, information operations uh, in the last um, several years. Uh, so uh, public, uh, public reports indicate that um, this is the actor that's involved not only in the uh, DNC hack, but also uh, intrusions into the German Bundestag, 
Estonian energy company, um, a Nordic military, as well as a Finnish uh, individual involved in uh, open source research, a Bellingcat um, researcher. Uh, these are public reports. Uh, FireEye is a company uh, regularly catches these threat actors conducting operations against a variety of targets all around the world. Um, even just in the last couple of months, we've identified a number of their campaigns. Uh, these guys are very active, highly resourced. Uh, this group has uh, uh, used more uh, zero-day vulnerabilities, so previously unknown vulnerabilities that are uh, rare and valuable and uh, highly effective uh, than any other threat group that uh, we have followed in our existence as a company. Uh, and so uh, this is definitely a prominent threat to the region. Um, I've just uh, outlined some of their tactics here. Uh, so uh, for any of you that work in organizations that this threat actor might target, uh, this is just goes to show you the variety of tactics that they use. Um, a lot of uh, social engineering, a lot of spear phishing uh, for initial access. They'll, uh, they'll send documents that uh, many of you may consider uh, very interesting, depending on who you are and what you do. Uh, recent document lures have included uh, Sabre Guardian exercise, for example, or uh, SciCon US, a cybersecurity conference. Uh, and so they'll often uh, they'll pick their targets, they'll design social engineering <coughs> lures to, uh, to, uh, that are geared towards uh, the target's interests uh, or the target group's interests. Um, and then uh, usually there'll be some kind of uh, link or attachment um, Links will lead to uh, compromised websites that host their malware attachments. Uh, often will just uh, uh, launch and execute that malware, uh, especially in many cases after uh, you download the attachment and then it says, hey, would you like to enable malicious macros or uh, any other kind of like user input after uh, you download a file is, is very, very suspicious and often exploited by uh, these and many other threat actors. So. Um, uh, so, but they're also uh, very skillful in just uh, uh, technical threat activity, uh, compromising your uh, organization's web servers. Uh, yeah. So uh, that was a uh, slightly closer look at one particular Russian cyber threat actor uh, that is active in the region and threatens uh, Nordic security and. Uh, that supports the strategic interests of the Russian Federation. Uh, let's transition now to uh, China Nexus uh, threat actors and threats. Uh, so um, these organizations, these groups, um, we assess uh, present the most risk of economic espionage to Nordic countries. We've seen them uh, target a variety of different um, enterprises in in many, many, many sectors. Um, this activity has. Uh, fallen off a, a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, many people think that uh, China has become more focused in their uh, targeting, uh, spraying less wildly, to use a uh, tactical military term, um, and, uh, and essentially is, uh, is consolidating their capabilities and is uh, choosing their targets more wisely and, uh, and their, their capabilities have become more advanced. But um, in the last, uh, broadly speaking, in the last maybe uh, half decade or so, uh, we've seen a number of these uh, threat actors target Nordic uh, governments, enterprises, uh, more than a dozen distinct threat actors targeting uh, the Nordics in Germany. Um, we've observed them targeting a variety of different industries. I mean, you have a lot of them up there, everything from uh, transportation to business services to the chemical industry to what have you. Yeah, if your company is uh, uh, globally competitive, successful, uh, has intellectual property that uh, would support uh, Chinese economic development, um, and especially if you happen to be uh, both active in China and in a field that uh, China considers to be in its strategic interest, including high tech, including renewable energy and so on, uh, you really want to uh, think very closely about how you protect that uh, data and that information from uh, China Nexus threat actors. So a lot of the information that they've stolen in the past, it was a lot more intellectual property. Nowadays, it's more uh, sort of competitive and in business intelligence, including uh, business plans, executive communications, and so on.
just like I did with the Russian Nexus Cyber Threat Actors, I'll focus a little bit on one particular uh, China Nexus Threat Actor to sort of drive this activity home and, uh, and, and show you that I'm not just uh, speaking in very abstract terms, but uh, referring to very specific operations. So uh, APT-10 is a Chinese Cyber Threat Actor. Um, uh, that sort of well represents the threat that is faced by uh, Nordic companies. Um, in 2017, we identified APT-10 targeting a number of Nordic uh, energy and extractive sector enterprises, uh, as well as um, enterprises that uh, share uh, business contacts and partnerships with uh, those Nordic enterprises all around the world, in Brazil and East Asia and so on. Um, the, uh, the group has previously uh, sort of uh, conducted operations that uh, involve both political espionage and uh, economic espionage. Um, so they've uh, uh, supported national security goals as well as uh, economic development goals for China. Uh, this is an interesting case partially because it represents the resurgence of a threat actor. So this is one that we saw uh, go quiet around the world for some time, especially after 2015. Uh, but we've recently seen them kind of resurface uh, with new tools, uh, somewhat new techniques, and a renewed focus. And it represents a, uh, a real and serious threat to uh, Nordic enterprises. Uh, just to illustrate uh, in a little bit greater detail and to bring back that attacker life cycle from, uh, from earlier in the presentation, uh, this goes to show how the techniques and tactics and uh, tools of this particular threat actor uh, are portrayed along this uh, sort of attacker life cycle. So uh, often APT-10 will send spear phishing emails uh, or they'll compromise um, third-party service providers. So this can be like uh, law firms or IT service companies and so on in order to get access to their ultimate target. Uh, they'll deploy often uh, a remote access trojan, uh, a, a type of malware that has essentially backdoor um, that allows them access to your system. Uh, this one is called Shogu that they use. Uh, once they get access, uh, oftentimes they'll try to go uh, much quieter. Uh, than they were in their sort of uh, foothold stage. They'll use the uh, native Windows commands of the uh, system that, they're, uh, that they've compromised to look further around the network, see what else is going on, what else the, their uh, first target uh, has access to and, uh, and touches in the network. Um, and then they'll um, basically conduct further activities to get deeper into the network. They'll uh, use password dumping tools to uh, access different servers, different endpoints, uh, lock keystrokes of uh, particular uh, systems in order to discover passwords, in order to uh, figure out sensitive information that, uh, that their target is, uh, is typing under their system. And they'll use things called scheduled tasks to maintain persistence. And ultimately, their goal is to steal information. So they'll target your system. They'll uh, try to look around, get to the get to the information that they want and need, and ultimately exfiltrate that back to their um, back to their uh, so-called uh, command and control servers, and uh, ultimately probably for use uh, supporting China's uh, strategic uh, national security and economic development goals. Uh, more quickly, uh, I'll go through uh, what we refer to as information operations. So. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what you uh, may refer to as information operations more broadly will include uh, media providers, will include uh, sort of uh, individuals or fake personas on Twitter and whatever. Um, while that is a serious conversation, a serious threat, I'm going to uh, not touch on those in my presentation. Um, when I say information operations in this particular case, I'll uh, it's basically the type of activity that you saw in 2016 against the U.S., where uh, cyber espionage operations that, um, that uh, uh, resulted in the theft of sensitive data, uh, that data was then publicized very widely for political effect. And so here you see, uh, especially APT-28 as a threat actor, uh, and the danger that they pose, because not only can they uh, have they proven that they are capable of stealing that information, uh, you also have to worry about that information then, that confidential 
uh, sometimes extremely sensitive information uh, being released through a variety of personas and uh, fronts uh, to the wider audience in order to affect not just military decision making or, um, you know, specialized diplomatic formats, but uh, influence the opinions of uh, everyday people, voters, um, you know, uh, essentially the public at large. Uh, so often these will be uh, very strategically timed leaks. Um, they'll uh, follow uh, what's going on in the wider political context and uh, insert that information at a very specific time. Uh, and also, they uh, very often target dissemination towards um, towards journalists that they believe will cover their uh, story and their information to, uh, in some cases, people that are very active on social media that they know will spread that information. Uh, and so it starts off with a very specific act of cyber espionage, and it results in uh, essentially the large-scale uh, influence of public opinion through the targeted dissemination of specific information. Uh, another uh, sort of connected uh, smaller threat to uh, the Nordics in cybersecurity is something that I'll refer to as inf infrastructure abuse. So uh, essentially, um, advanced threat actors will not just, you know, essentially take their uh, computers in the GRU or whatever, uh, and then just like directly strike at uh, their ultimate targets. Uh, a lot of times, uh, in order to conduct advanced uh, operations, you need to set up a certain infrastructure to support those operations, whether that's uh, registering websites, uh, registering, uh, you know, servers and cloud providers and so on. Um, but what they'll also do, and in many cases, very advanced threat actors do this, is they'll compromise a number of intermediary nodes. Uh, they can compromise, uh, you know, a, a small uh, farm server in Sweden and, uh, you know, a uh, grocery store uh, in uh, Oslo and uh, then uh, use that infrastructure to conduct operations uh, against, uh, you know, the Ministry of Defense or the Armed Forces or whatever. Uh, and so we've seen, we've identified a number of cases in which advanced threat actors have, uh, have uh, targeted uh, what we assume in many cases are uh, basically small businesses uh, and use that infrastructure in order to conduct advanced uh, operations. And so this is uh, dangerous for a number of reasons. First, of course, smaller organizations are very unlikely to be able to effectively protect themselves against uh, these essentially military intelligence agencies. Um, but also it uh, provides a risk of um, miscommunication and uh, false flag attacks in the sense that the defenders who are identifying this activity uh, will see that, uh, you know, for example, the information that they've stolen to complete that information looks like it's going to, uh, you know, uh, a small business in Norway, which of course makes uh, no sense, but, uh, you know, it can, it can be... Uh, if the operation is important enough, that can result in some very intense conversations between uh, national security staff. So this is a danger. Uh, it requires a lot of international cooperation to uh, to deal with uh, some of these threat actors, and uh, it's just a um, essentially a small connected risk to uh, Nordic security. And finally, uh, I want to take a minute or two to talk about the risk to uh, critical infrastructure, but in particular, uh, critical energy infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, FireEye as a company uh, with our global footprint has identified a lot, a lot, a lot of threat actors that target the energy sector in particular. Uh, I can't say exactly how many, but uh, more than two dozen, let's put it that way. Um, we've seen uh, a uh, a rise in the use of uh, destructive capabilities specifically. Um, so uh, we have identified that uh, a lot of these capabilities that uh, countries are, um, are uh, working to achieve, um, they test them in conflict zones where there's likely to be uh, minimal diplomatic and political blowback, um, where uh, there's already much bigger problems going on, essentially, and, uh, and uh, essentially where they uh, feel that the target 
uh, is not capable of um, essentially uh, conducting countermeasures that are uh, likely to result in escalation more than you know already the active conflict zone may may have. So um, certainly Ukraine is a prime case of this, where we've seen, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Sandworm team conducting operations against uh, the power grid. First. Uh, two cases where confirmed cases where we've seen uh, cyber threat activity result in uh, the uh, blackout of you know entire uh, sections of the country. Um, this we consider to be you know probably not their goal essentially to have a blackout for some amount of time. While that could be very effective, uh, but that's a demonstration of a capability, a demonstration of the. Uh, uh, also the intent in this particular case to carry out destructive uh, attacks and this is certainly something that uh, the Nordics and, and basically everybody else in the world from our perspective uh, should keep a close eye on. That's uh, It's been talked about for a while, some of these capabilities are now maturing um, and that actually brings me to my next point which is uh, the proliferation of these capabilities. So. Uh, Niels in his introduction mentioned the Stuxnet case, um, certainly um, many of you have heard about that one. It's worth studying very closely. Uh, the Sandworm team uh, operations against Ukraine are also a major event in cybersecurity and I would say international relations history to some degree. Um, but we've now seen that more actors are developing these kind of capabilities. So uh, uh, Mandiant, which is a division of FireEye, which is uh, probably the premier uh, provider of incident response services around the world, uh, we've uh, covered uh, the Sony attack, the Equifax hack. Uh, a lot of the big uh, cybersecurity news that you see often has a division of FireEye uh, conducting the incident response. And uh, in a recent engagement in the Middle East, we identified a threat actor that uh, has developed industrial control system specific uh, malware. Uh, this is a, uh, a process that would require uh, very specialized experts working for uh, usually quite a long time uh, with uh, extensive resources uh, to reverse engineer uh, code that's provided by uh, you know major uh, industrial control system providers then figure out vulnerabilities in that code then devise tools that can uh, make uh, the automatic uh, execution of malicious code possible on uh, those targets then usually they'll test those in their own lab so if you've read the Stuxnet case uh, and, uh, the journalist that covered that in the greatest detail in her book, Kim Zetter, um, brought out some information that um, uh, since this was such a, an advanced operation and since they were using such uh, uh, intense capabilities, they certainly wanted to test it out in a lab before they deployed it against, uh, against a live target. So the same way uh, militaries would try to uh, you know, conduct exercises on, uh, on a regular basis in order to be uh, best prepared for defensive and offensive operations. The same way advanced cyber threat actors, when they develop, spend a lot of time and effort developing this kind of capability, they want to test it out. Uh, we hypothesize that the threat actor uh, either obtained this ICS equipment, which is pretty difficult, um, uh, or stole it, uh, or uh, stole the source code from their ultimate target. Uh, tried uh, a variety of their capabilities out in a lab environment, which already um, suggests uh, advanced resources, and then deployed it and actually tried to uh, conduct an ICS attack. Uh, thankfully, in this particular case, uh, they failed. Uh, they were discovered. Um, our uh, incident responders uh, investigated the attack, and we're now in the process of uh, spreading information about what this capability is. Um, but. Uh, there's also a lot of speculation uh, in the information security community about who the target was, who the threat actors were. Um, I won't go into that here, but I will say that it's another case of uh, the proliferation of this kind of capability, which is very advanced, which is usually nation state sponsored, uh, and which should provide pause to any companies that um, have industrial control system equipment. Uh, in that particular incident response engagement, uh, this capability ended up triggering a safety system, messing up a safety system. So you can see how uh, this kind of attack can have physical effects, can even endanger lives. Uh, and the proliferation of these capabilities is also uh, dangerous, partially because uh, 
essentially, the uh, risk appetite of their sponsors is, uh, is a significant factor in how these capabilities are deployed, um, where they're deployed, and so on. Um, and so uh, specific actors that we've seen engage in um, attacks against critical infrastructure, I mean, many, many uh, cases of industrial espionage, cyber espionage, uh, many cases of uh, trying to steal ICS-related information to map and understand, scan those networks and map them, uh, but very few actual um, uh, tools and malware capabilities to uh, automate those attacks against many systems. But uh, Sandworm team is an actor. Uh, what uh, Dragonfly 2.0, or what we refer to as Temp Isotope, is an actor that's conducting this kind of uh, ICS reconnaissance. Uh, and uh, the Koala team, who I mentioned before, in 2014 was extremely active in, uh, in targeting, uh, including, I understand, uh, uh, in, in Europe and North America, basically everywhere in the world, targeting organizations for uh, essentially, among other things, uh, mapping out uh, ICS systems. So, um, with that briefing, hopefully I stayed. Uh, in the time frame, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to uh, uh, discuss with you some of the aspects of uh, what I briefed you on, and uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for giving us such a good overview of the cyber intelligence and the Nordic uh, threat landscape. I would now like to invite uh, Lily to give a brief uh, comments and uh, a couple of questions to Patrick, and then you will get an opportunity to respond to that. And then we will continue the discussion and open the floor for questions for you. Anpa? Yeah. All right. Hi. Thank you so much, Patrick, for a very good a briefing on cyber intelligence. I think a lot of the audience here have benefited greatly from your division of not just us or people coming here talking about cybersecurity, but understanding what the threat is and the actors. And I saw a lot of phones taking pictures of the different types of groups. I think that's a very valuable understanding to understand that the different APTs or the different threats, um, but they also target differently. And where they operate, I think, is a very valuable understanding to try and understand what it is this threat is that we're talking about and not just talking about cybersecurity and a threat in cyberspace, but understanding that these actors are actually different actors makes it more visible in a way. I think my first question to that is if you can tell us something more about how FIRE you as a company uh, separate the intel you get, how do you classify as APT29 or APT28 or how do you know it's a different type of group? I think that would be also within the political context being here at Nupi, is it, is, is it just codes that you're looking at and you're like, oh, we recognize this code, or do you put it in a political context? Mm -hmm. um, and on this attribution, I guess a follow-up point is, um, is there any bias in this? Uh, so what measures do you take? And also who benefits from knowing? What's the benefit of knowing that it's APT 29 or 28? Um, secondly, uh, you can write that down. I have three questions and then I'll let you guys also uh, ask the two ones are, and they're shorter the ones coming um, so and I'm also curious to this is a you talked a lot about Intel and how you work and collect information but uh, if you can tell us anything about offensive cyber operations that's become more and more into the uh, scene these days if FireEye also operates anyway offensive if it's, if it's just Intel collecting uh, and within that um, the last more critical question, or not critical, but asking question. Uh, we heard about China and Russia today, but um, what about America's uh, offensive postures? Can you talk about or tell us anything about um, what they do or their offensive capabilities, or if you follow them at all? That would be interesting to us. Um, yeah, I think I have, well, I'll stop there. I'll let you answer, and then you guys can also ask some questions if you want to. So yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. I guess so. Thanks. All right. So, uh, I, uh, when we were setting up this briefing with uh, Nupi, I mentioned that as an intelligence analyst, I can 
Uh, often we'll have to speak to in some degrees of abstraction. Uh, very rarely, if ever, will I make uh, statements about policy uh, other than from a personal perspective. And uh, certainly the question of offensive capabilities, um, uh, especially from the uh, country that we uh, are headquartered in, is a uh, challenging question that I'll almost certainly skirt around. Um, but uh, those disclaimers aside, I'll do my best to provide some interesting responses to uh, to those questions. So uh, essentially, the process of cyber intelligence, if we're going to dive deeper into it, starts with, uh, starts with identifying some technical data. So we'll identify uh, a bad file or a uh, suspicious uh, website that's serving up some strange code or um, you know, a, uh, a, a website that's been registered that uh, looks very similar to uh, a different website of a legitimate organization. It'll start off with those technical pieces of data. Um, sometimes it can be on the network, so, uh, you know, weird, uh, weird communication between computers and so on. Uh, and you'll take that initial data point and then you'll start to see uh, how it connects to other data points. So. Uh, who is, uh, you know, who is the other partner in the communication between computers? Um, what uh, code is this website serving up? Uh, you know, how, uh, how is this particular file malicious? What does it do that's bad? Uh, so uh, at that point, you start to investigate, essentially. Um, so uh, in the case of FireEye, the detections will come from FireEye uh, technology deployed around the world. Uh, but also from uh, human intelligence research on dark web forums and so on. Uh, but when you take those uh, initial uh, technical data, often they're referred to as indicators of compromise, a particular file or a particular uh, network uh, indicator of uh, suspicious communication, uh, and you kind, of, uh, you kind of pull the thread, you chase it, you see where it leads, you start to, uh, you start to identify a specific kind of infrastructure. So, when you see like weird communication uh, going between, uh, you know, a, a, a noopy computer, for example, and a uh, and a known bad web address, you want to see what that communication involves. You, uh, and so over over the course of um, essentially following these advanced threat actors for uh, months, years, uh, throughout the course of uh, seeing them in around the world for. Uh, you know, uh, tens, dozens, hundreds of times, uh, you start to connect more and more of these indicators together. So uh, you start to see that, um, you know, this uh, kind of malware that we identified in this system is also, uh, you know, uh, used in a breach in this other system. You start to put together, uh, you start with technical data, and ultimately uh, you work your way out to uh, putting together these so-called indicators of compromise into uh, connected data sets uh, that then uh, you uh, decipher essentially, infer, uh, deduce uh, particular tactics and tools that are used by uh, uh, particular groups. And then uh, ultimately uh, you also, uh, you know, sort of at the more strategic level, you do start to conduct political analysis. Um, and so uh, that essentially is the process uh, for, uh, at a very uh, abstract form, uh, for how we identify and characterize these threat actors. Uh, that being said, when I refer to APTs, and often you'll see numbers behind them, that is a FireEye terminology and a particular FireEye process for how we group threat activity. And so uh, we follow um, somewhere in the vicinity of a thousand, probably more, um, uh, threat actors around the world where we've managed to group some activity together that looks suspicious, that shares uh, relationships and characteristics. Very few of them have we graduated to APT status. So when you see APT, often it'll be the uh, teams that conduct the most operations, in some cases more brazenly and more uh, visibly, um, and, uh, and, you know, who uh, essentially, we have uh, managed to gather enough information on to have a uh, sort of very confident uh, view of what they've done, how they've done it, and to some degree, why they've done it. Um, so certainly, who benefits from, uh, from that work that uh, we and other security companies do and government agencies do, and even, uh, in many cases, uh, security teams at bigger companies themselves uh, who have cyber intelligence functions nowadays do, 
uh, who benefits from that is essentially their customers, right? So just how in the same way that intelligence in the national security field has customers, intelligence agencies are conducting analysis just for their own benefit. They're uh, disseminating that to uh, policymakers, executives, whoever, uh, military leaders. Uh, the same way cyber intelligence disseminated to the right decision maker uh, can help uh, can help those decision makers, whether they're IT managers that decide that a particular patch needs to be prioritized, or their uh, company executives that need to decide how to invest the next uh, you know two million dollars that they just got uh, in their budget um, for in cybersecurity. Um, the the end customer for that cyber intelligence is the one that matters. So in this particular case, I would be the cyber intelligence analyst. All of you would be my customers in that I provided the briefing to you, and hopefully the benefit is that the, you more now understand the threat landscape at large in Nordic security. Um, how we uh, get that intelligence is certainly uh, a question that we get a lot. Um, so FireEye, uh, our main business is not uh, cyber intelligence. Cyber intelligence is kind of a tangential business. Our main business is uh, technology and services. So uh, where we get that information is essentially our uh, technology deployed around the world, our sensors that are picking up and detecting attacks, uh, and also our services. So we'll go in, uh, for example, in incident response engagements. We'll see uh, what the bad guys are doing on the networks, uh, how they're doing it, and so on. Um, but we also have a component, like I mentioned, that includes essentially human intelligence. So these will be uh, very specific uh, individuals with language skills and credibility in their, uh, in their particular countries that uh, will uh, be active in various uh, underground forums in order to uh, get information, uh, find new exploits that are being sold and traded in the underground marketplaces, discover databases that have been uh, breached, exfiltrated, and now for sale online, uh, and, uh, and you know, whatever else goes on on the, uh, on the underground web forums, essentially. So it, it's, a comp it's a compilation of a lot of different data sources that uh, analysts like me will then look at and uh, turn that sort of data into intelligence. Um, and we uh, gather intelligence uh, around the world, uh, however we can, except not in illegal ways. So certainly FireEye does not conduct uh, offensive operations ourselves as a company uh, against targets in order to figure out who they are, why they do what they do. Uh, sometimes um, that line can get pretty blurry. Um, like it's not illegal to log on to a website that bad guys may use that they you know haven't put a password on for example it's not illegal to navigate to a website right but if bad guys leave their infrastructure wide open we can kind of you know take a look around essentially um, but we certainly don't conduct offensive operations for any reason uh, not to conduct intelligence otherwise we have a penetration testing service where uh, our offensive security experts on a contractual basis and with a very specifically defined scope will try to, uh, will, be, will be hired by customers to try to penetrate their systems in order to identify weaknesses that those customers can then solve themselves in a very structured and ethical way. Uh, but we certainly don't conduct operations ourselves against some of the, uh, some of the threat actors that you see uh, up there on the board. Uh, <laughs> When it comes to uh, U.S. offensive capabilities, or for, for that matter, uh, the capabilities of uh, Western countries more broadly, um, what I can say is that FireEye as a company uh, certainly thinks that China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are the most dangerous threat actors to our customers. Um, but uh, it would be naive to think that if a country announces that it's spending a certain amount of money on uh, cybersecurity and especially offensive capabilities that then they also don't have those same kind of capabilities. Uh, we, uh, when we see threat activity from uh, these kind of sources, we may collect it, we certainly help our customers deal with it and defend themselves against it, uh, but uh, whether it's because uh, our customers may not be the uh, priority intelligence target of uh, those countries with those capabilities in the West, or for whatever reason, uh, we don't see their activity as much. We don't uh, deal with it as often, but uh, we have seen it. We have 
uh, notified our customers about it. Uh, in isolated cases, we've published about it. For example, when uh, when we've seen zero-day vulnerabilities being used, um, whether in the wild or against our customers, uh, we've let, uh, in cooperation with the, uh, whether it's Microsoft or Adobe or whoever's uh, software is being uh, exploited, we've worked with those companies to publicize that information so that uh, so that uh, other threat actors can't use that zero-day vulnerability against against their customers. So it would be naive to think that uh, Western countries don't have those capabilities, but we certainly uh, we don't think they're as much of a threat to our customers. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now open the floor for questions. Uh, Please introduce yourself and affiliation with name and affiliation before you, if you, and wait for the microphone. It's coming right here now. Much. Okay. I need to speak louder. My name is Nedim Makaric. I'm ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, sir, it's an honor to, um, first of all, it's an honor to be here. A very interesting lecture. Uh, it happened to be the time you're also your colleague. I dealt with hybrid cryptography uh, back that time, Bruce Schneier and everything. Mm, what I want to know, it's a bit provocative, but I'll just ask. Um, yeah, um, okay, uh, 13 years ago, exactly 15 years ago, there was a book from Mr. Udo Kotte, German author, about NSA American espionage towards Germany with the name theft among the friends. So he's uh, very precisely, uh, he's listing the cases and he focused himself just on industrial espionage, which uh, US did to Germany exactly with the name of the companies and how they did it. A few years afterwards, we had this case of tapping of the whole Bundestag in Berlin from the NSA. It was a huge scandal six years ago. Um, your comments on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Sorry. <laughs> well, that sounds like a fascinating book. Um, I'd be very interested in reading it. Um, we uh, evaluate open source evidence about uh, U.S. offensive capabilities. We keep a very close eye on what uh, uh, the media, other companies, uh, U.S. government agencies themselves, and the uh, potential targets of U.S. offensive operations uh, say what kinds of capabilities exist. Uh, we certainly evaluate the credibility of uh, sources that uh, provide that kind of information. Um, but I uh, don't have uh, very much, uh, you know, analysis myself to add to that. Um, if, uh, if a country like the United States or Norway or anybody else decides that it's in their national interest to conduct espionage against another country, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is uh, a legal gray area in international relations not defined by international law um, that uh, certainly may have political and economic impact and, and you know, definitely can have an IT and a security uh, impact. Um, but. Uh, you know, the, the countries themselves that have these capabilities uh, must decide uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's in their interest to do so or not, evaluate the risks themselves and, uh, uh, and decide whether to conduct operations or not. Um, we, uh, you know, there are open source, uh, open source materials that indicate that many Western countries have conducted industrial espionage to, to some degree. Um, I think uh, readers themselves will have to figure out whether uh, whether that source is credible, whether they believe that information, whether they and their companies or employers need to take uh, defensive measures against that kind of activity. Uh, and you know, I uh, do think that if uh, my company, for example, uh, identified this kind of activity, we would probably. Uh, we would certainly try to defend our customers against it, and uh, we would try to tactfully navigate the international relations implications of uh, that kind of activity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, then there's the gentleman in white shirt over to the right. Hi, um, Simon. I'm Simon Larsrot from DMB. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, the target selection for especially the Chinese and Russian nexus. Uh, what makes them a threat to the specific sectors and also specific organizations? How do they end up on our doorstep? Uh, and uh, how these actors work out their target selection, yeah, especially if you can contrast and compare the Chinese and the Russian ones. Thank you for that question. Um, it is an important one. Um, obviously, uh, other than identifying specific cases of operations conducted against our customers and, and finding other information online, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, for someone like me to say uh, how the actors behind the cyber espionage groups make their decisions, right? Um, you know, let's, uh, for the sake of, uh, for the sake of argument and uh, very tentatively say that some of this activity, for example, is sponsored by uh, Russian or Chinese uh, foreign intelligence, military intelligence agencies, right? Uh, what they do and what their mission is uh, will determine who their targets are. Um, there's been some pretty interesting uh, media reports recently uh, about APT-28 targeting where uh, at one point APT-28 left a, a tentative target list uh, openly accessible online. A company, uh, Dell SecureWorks, uh, was able to access this and then they passed this on to uh, journalists who then did a very uh, Raphael Sader, I believe, is the lead journalist in that case, uh, has done a very thorough investigation of uh, who, these, uh, who these targets are. Uh, and so that gives you an idea. Um, when we talk about uh, Russian nexus cyber threat actors, uh, historically we've seen them uh, target uh, media, a lot of journalists. Uh, other companies have identified them targeting dis domestic dissidents. Uh, but when you think about who uh, would be uh, foreign intelligence targets for uh, these uh, organizations that might be behind it, you get a good idea of who the targets are. So uh, if I were a Russian foreign intelligence agency uh, with the mission that they have, uh, or military intelligence agency, I would likely target uh, parliaments, I would target ministries of foreign affairs, ministries of defense, uh, um, you know, uh, I would think about who uh, what strategic sectors uh, Russian uh, agencies want to support. So when we think about the Russian economy, defense and, uh, defense and energy come to mind pretty quickly. We've, uh, we've seen a lot of Russian cyber threat actors conduct activities against those. Uh, but we've also seen very far-flung, wide, sometimes strange targeting from a lot of these organizations. So, uh, you know, sometimes they'll have targeted uh, pharmaceutical companies, for example, or they'll have targeted uh, law firms. In some cases, you can hypothesize that they were ultimately using this to target, you know, a law firm customer, or uh, maybe you know they figure that they really need this particular intellectual property to support this particular uh, health initiative. For example, um, we saw some interesting targeting, especially after 2014, when sanctions started coming up against uh, sectors that uh, might have been affected by sanctions, might have been affected by. Uh, decreasing Russian capability uh, in terms of uh, in terms of their economic health. Uh, so when you're spending more and more of your money as a country on uh, military operations uh, and uh, dealing with sanctions, and you don't have a very competitive economy, you know, and your people start grumbling about health and pensions and so on, uh, you as a government may be interested in conducting operations to uh, steal some things that you may not be able to produce yourself and so on. Um, when it comes to China nexus threat actors, a large majority of the activity that we've identified has been against private sector entities, uh, uh, largely for the purpose of, uh, for the first like 10 years from 2005 to 2015, for the purpose of intellectual property theft to support uh, Chinese uh, national companies. Um, and, you know, basically like every sector that you can imagine that China needed to uh, advance in for its general economic development was targeted by these threat actors. So, uh, you know, we made the joke yesterday with Lily over uh, over dinner that, you know, if uh, if a Nordic company produces the next great 
uh, you know, tractor scoop or, you know, like biomass uh, converter or whatever, you might not think that that would be the target of Chinese uh, foreign intelligence activity when in fact these kind of innovations are exactly what they may need to fulfill specific economic goals, whether it's in food security or energy security or uh, any of the variety of problems that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, we're now we're now starting to uh, worry about China and excess uh, threat activity against extremely high-tech strategic sectors like uh, artificial intelligence or quantum computing, uh, because we've seen them transition now from a developing country that, uh, you know, uh, in a variety of ways brought 500 million people out of poverty into a, uh, a country that is becoming a a uh, global power that uh, wants to generate its own intellectual property but may still be willing to steal and risk diplomatic blowback against very strategic sectors where uh, a global competitive advantage such as in uh, in those fields might provide um, you know benefits so uh, but I mean absolutely we've seen uh, China Nexus targeting of governments as well so uh, army uh, militaries um, militaries, uh, parliaments, uh, mili uh, ministries of foreign affairs, uh, especially more recently in the East Asia area. So we've seen uh, heavy targeting of Japan and South Korea and uh, the Southeast Asian uh, region, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, that kind of thing, uh, largely in relation to the South China Sea economic and political questions. Uh, and increasingly, when we think about what uh, China is planning on doing, when we think about uh, large-scale uh, projects like the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, when we think about uh, these flagship projects that China uh, has uh, or will continue to put billions and billions of dollars into, uh, you know, it would be uh, reasonable, I would argue, to think that they will use all of the levers of national power to make these flagship project a, projects a success. Uh, and so I would very much caution uh, those countries dealing with uh, uh, infrastructure projects and so on to watch out also for uh, espionage against them. Yep. Uh, I have a a question here. So. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Christofferson. I'm a journalist in uh, ABC News, but not uh, American ABC News, but the Norwegian ABC News. Um, you mentioned that uh, small companies and individuals are being targeted, some kind of like a proxy start startup uh, base for a broader attack on some something else. Uh, are individuals getting increasingly targeted in uh, in this aspect? Uh, this is one of my questions. And when I talk to uh, normal people about cybersecurity, they also saying that they have nothing to hide. So that's perfectly fine. So what do you think about that? <laughs> Well, everybody's got something to hide. Um, everybody also has money in the form of data in the Western world. So um, if you don't think you have anything to steal or hide, then you must be you know, pretty naive from my perspective. Um, but uh, certainly individuals have always been targeted. So when you think about, uh, when you think about traditional espionage, uh, usually sources of information will often inc include human sources, right? So. Uh, you'll try to exploit some vulnerabilities in uh, a person's psyche to uh, get them to divulge secrets. Uh, the same way uh, an individual's online activity uh, can be targeted and can be exploited in a variety of ways. Um, you know, when we talk about targeting of uh, companies and countries, uh, in most cases, or in many cases, where we're looking at specific uh, human targets for social engineering inside of those organizations for access. So, uh, you know, it's, it's up to you to, to figure out how uh, you want to do this, but you can use uh, LinkedIn, you can use Facebook, you can use uh, news reports, whatever, to find information about specific targets that then you can uh, conduct uh, effective social engineering attacks against. So. Certainly humans are at the very center of this activity in a variety of ways. 
um, you know, I would caution every individual in this room and otherwise to make sure that you have, uh, you know, a firewall implemented to have full disk encryption, to have uh, antivirus and anti-malware and use a VPN and so on, uh, password manager in many cases. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly individual cyber hygiene in your workplace as well can, um, can make the difference between a uh, successful nation state attack and an unsuccessful one. Um, so definitely humans are at the center of this in, in a variety of ways. Yeah, I see time is uh, soon running out, but if we have some, yeah, there's one there and one behind. Hi, um, Ben Knox from the Norwegian Defense Cyber Academy. Um, Norway is the host nation for Exercise Trident Juncture this year. It's NATO's largest high readiness exercise, and uh, it incorporates the Baltics and North Atlantic as well. Um, this is not just a military exercise, and Norway uh, will be opening itself up to multiple vulnerabilities. And um, I would uh, suggest that one cheap and easy vulnerability is through the cyber domain, and it wouldn't just affect defense. I think. Uh, the, the one road that runs up and down the center of Norway uh, is vital for fishing, uh, transportation, and logistics. Have you got any thoughts and comments about uh, the possible effects of any kind of advanced actor looking at um, intelligence-led operations uh, before and during Exercise Trident Juncture? Well, um, very interesting question. Uh, I'll, uh, as you've asked me to answer in a hypothetical format, I think I'll do that as well. Um, certainly, uh, many countries in NATO and otherwise are finding that uh, since cyber operations can affect their military capability and readiness and so on, they've integrated cyber uh, into their military exercises. If you uh, if you want to know what you can uh, and will have to protect yourself against in, a, in an actual conflict, uh, you want to practice that out in your exercises, right? So I think that's a, that's a very good development, uh, should be encouraged and should continue. Uh, if you think about exactly how you want your exercise scenario to play out, what kind of sort of inject you want to put in, uh, certainly you can have some interesting cyber scenarios. Uh, you know Norway uh, and its infrastructure far better than I can or do, um, but I would say that if you think about, uh, if you're, if you're uh, developing the scenario and you're developing these injects, um, if you think about all of the infrastructure in Norway that's controlled by uh, computers to some degree, I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty wide range. Many of our countries have, uh, you know, a lot of different sectors of critical infrastructure that can be affected by cyber operations. Uh, definitely you can get very creative there. I mean, if, uh, I don't know, if your tunnel lights don't work in a particularly strategic area and that throws in a major hurdle for, you know, logistics, um, you know, that's, uh, you can, basically you can get as creative as you want on these kind of injects, right? Uh, if, uh, on the other hand, you want to base your scenario and your exercise in the injects that the participants will have to deal with on, uh, on previous cyber operations that have already happened, then cyber intelligence can be uh, very useful in that regard. So if you want to prepare yourself uh, or the exercise against uh, not just some imaginary, omnipotent, phantom uh, hoodie man, uh, but you want to prepare yourself against the threat actors that are actually active and out there and uh, targeting your country on a regular basis, then I would suggest taking a very close look at the kind of uh, operations that have already taken place uh, against telecommunications sectors, against uh, energy sectors, against um, military uh, exercise uh, systems. I'm sure you uh, know about the Swedish case. Um, and, uh, you know, definitely uh, I would argue uh, from my personal perspective, it would make more sense to focus not on just some a uh, hypothetical thing that uh, we haven't seen in the real world, uh, but focus on what we've actually seen in the real world, what we 
uh, think these uh, particular actors might, what kinds of capabilities they might be uh, developing right now, what's possible uh, is not necessarily what they would use. Um, and so uh, this applies more broadly as well when you uh, hear media uh, sort of fervor about the newest vulnerability or the newest threat that doesn't necessarily mean every bad guy is immediately going to start doing that. What they're going to do, what's effective, what works, what gets their uh, mission completed. And so uh, when you think about who uh, the military exercise is focused on, uh, you'll want to think about the types of missions that your adversary wants to uh, complete, not just in the air, air, sea, and land domains, but also you know, in cyber and space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were certainly a lot of worries in the community about uh, Zapod, for example, but otherwise, too. I mean, these are, these are major exercises that uh, create a, a lot of attention and focus on the host nation or the uh, hypothetical targets. And, uh, you know, if you prevent a, uh, prevent a major exercise, that's a major uh, victory for the country that doesn't want that exercise to take place, that doesn't want you to practice those capabilities, that doesn't want you to uh, have a successful uh, military and uh, political establishment. So, um, okay, last uh, question, uh, and please be brief because we're running out. Very brief question. I'm Peter. I work for Telenor Group. I had a chance to look over the FireEye 2018 predictions report, where you guys uh, pointed to Iran as kind of an up and coming. Uh, advanced uh, threat actor. So I was hoping you could speak about that just briefly for a couple minutes. Thank you. Certainly, I'll do my best. Uh, it's uh, it's certainly a, a rising threat, I would say. So uh, whereas we've seen a lot of, uh, I want to preface too by saying that uh, in my day-to-day -day work, I mainly focus on Russian nexus threat actors and uh, Europe and North America, but uh, obviously, the company is very focused on Iranian threat actors, uh, especially of late. So uh, we've graduated three different groups of uh, threat activity into APTs uh, recently. Uh, APT 33, 34, and 35 are all Iranian threat actors. So that gives you an idea of uh, when these, uh, when these uh, groups were active, and, uh, and certainly Iran is, uh, is high on our list of priorities at the moment as an intelligence provider. Um, Iran uh, has uh, matured its capabilities uh, very uh, quickly, I think, by international standards. Uh, it was, uh, we saw like pretty amateurish operations even up until like five years ago. Uh, still sometimes we see what we think are Iran Nexus threat actors doing some really silly and basic things, uh, but we're also starting to see uh, very, uh, very active, dangerous threat groups from Iran. Um, a lot of times they're focused on um, their immediate geographic environment, so the Middle East, South Asia. Uh, but increasingly, as they get more confident in their operations and their success and their capabilities, uh, they uh, will certainly start to uh, broaden their spectrum of uh, intelligence targets, and uh, we've already seen Iran Nexus actors conduct operations against uh, the U.S., against many um, many European targets, against uh, Asian targets, um, and certainly uh, we have some indications that Iran Nexus threat actors have also uh, targeted the Nordics. Um, I won't be able to go into much detail on that, but. There are other actors that have targeted the Nordics um, outside of Russian, China, Nexus threat actors. Uh, these capabilities are spreading more widely. Um, we have uh, many countries that don't necessarily get the most press, but that are developing capabilities that have on isolated occasions targeted uh, Nordic enterprises as well. I consider them more minor threats at the moment to Nordic security, uh, but certainly Iran uh, is is rising on the list of priorities, should be followed closely. and. Uh, FireEye is happy to help Telenor out on that front. Thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, that's it. Uh, I would just like to say that if you're interested in our activities, uh, you could sign up on our newsletter if you haven't done it already. You can also follow us on Twitter, uh, on Nupin, Nupinit on Twitter. Uh, and uh, yes, I would just like to say thank you very much to Patrick Maldre who came here and shared his unique insights. Thank you very much. Let's give him a, a hand. And thank you very much to Lily for giving her uh, very good comments and questions. Mm -hmm.